Hello, I'm Colin Snook. I'm a Senior Research Fellow in the Cyber-Physical Systems Group at the University of Southampton. In our research group, we um, develop formal modelling tools and processes for analysing cyber-physical systems. So why would we want to use formal modelling for cyber-physical systems? Well, they're large, costly, complicated infrastructure systems, and they um, often have safety and security critical properties. So it seems worth investing in detecting problems early as the consequences of mistakes could be expensive and, and quite severe. Uh, so to do this we need to verify that the critical properties will indeed be satisfied by the proposed system. Uh, but also there's various stakeholders like uh, domain experts and customers, uh, regulatory authorities, even uh, public um, representatives that need to approve the behaviour is um, of the proposed system is uh, suitable and acceptable. <clears throat> so formal modelling allows us to rigorously verify the requirements at an abstract level before the de design details are, are considered. And, and also through model animation um, we, we can use the formal modelling to engage stakeholders. Um, but <clears throat> clearly this kind of modelling requires a degree of investment of effort up front. But for these kind of systems anyway, um, traditional verification is going to be expensive. Um, in fact, the early detection of problems that formal modelling gives you tends to give savings in later testing. So this makes uh, formal modelling cost effective as well as um, having the benefits of reducing the risks of um, doing, having to do substantial rework. So where does our modelling fit into the development life cycle? Mostly we're talking about requirements analysis before any design stages are started. We can go down into the, the modelling the design uh, to some extent and we do have some code generators uh, but the real strength of the formal modelling lies in analysing requirements before the design. So initially we, we'd even like to abstract away from some of the more detailed requirements so that we can focus on the critical properties like safety and security of the system. And by extracting away from the details we can think clearly about the critical properties and make sure we model them correctly. Then we can add the details incrementally in refinements, verifying at each step that we not violated the previous uh, more abstract models. So in doing, doing this we, we begin to introduce the components involved in the system and their requirements, hence we're moving towards an architectural design. And once we've built up the uh, model of the requirements to some extent, we could then um, use model, model animation tools um, and to perform a kind of requirements acceptance test uh, before we go on to move, to um, start the design and implementation phases. Um, so this is what I mean by um, uh, engaging stakeholders using these um, model animation methods. And clearly it's much better to address um, any mis misconceptions or misunderstandings in the requirements at this stage rather than waiting until the system is implemented. This table lists the main tools we use for our formal modelling. At the top we have the Rodan modelling platform, which is an Eclipse-based modelling environment. And, and Rodan also contains support for the event B formal modelling language, including editors and static checking. And then we've developed a, a Camille X, which is a text-based framework for Event B that provides a human usable text persistence. And, um, and it also adds some certain extensions to support better model structuring. And then UMLB provides a diagrammatic modeling language, which is based on Event B. So that's all the modeling tools. Then we have the theorem provers. <coughs> Rodan already includes a framework for proof, uh, including proof obligation generation and um, a user interface that you can use for configuring the provers and, and also for doing manual proofs if you need to um, assist the if the automatic proofs don't um, succeed. Um, 
and then that framework allows other automatic theorem provers to be added. So um, the Atelier B theorem prover is one that provides uh, a predicate prover. And then we also have an adapter that allows the SMT solvers to be used um, uh, for proof. Uh, for debugging models, uh, when the proof obligations cannot be discharged by the provers, then we use the, the Pro-B model checker to find counterexamples. And Pro-B um, also has a single step animation mode, which we can use to, to check the behavior of the model is, as we expect. Uh, and then for visualization, B-Motion Studio is part of Pro-B and it allows us to create graphical visualizations of the state of the model um, so that we can view it as it is changed by Pro-B. And we can also animate the UMLB state machines to visualize behavior. Uh, on top of this, we've developed a, a scenario checker that can record and play back animations to assist in acceptance testing of models. And then finally, uh, we're looking at developing a way to run our scenarios as scripts um, using the Cucumber tools, which uh, are used in behavior-driven development. Um, <clears throat> and this will give us a kind of regression testing of the models. The UMLB um, provides a diagrammatic modeling interface for event B. It consists of class diagrams and state machines. So it's UML-like, but it's designed to fit well with event B. So it has some different semantics um, from UML. For example, there's no concept of external trigger events or run to completion in the state machines. Transmi transitions are simply fired spontaneously when they're Guards are true. Uh, UMLB includes a notion of refinement so that the initial abstract models are, are nice and simple, uh, allowing us to focus on the critical properties of the, the system. Then the diagrams can be refined to introduce more details about the system. And the refined diagrams are checked to, to ensure that they still preserve the abstract properties. And diagrams automatically generate event B for the verification. So event B is a formal modeling language based on set theory, predicate logic, and guarded events that change the state of the system. So we use theorem provers for um, verification uh, to check that the model is correctly constructed. And the sort of things we need to verify are that invariant properties are maintained so we, we use the invariants to specify critical properties of safety and security, for example. Uh, and then um, we also need to check that the refinements preserve the abstract behavior. So, so there's proof obligations for that. Uh, and then we also need to check that the model is well defined. Um, so, for example, if you want the, to find the maximum of a set of integers, then the set must be finite. Um, then, so the nice thing about using theorem proof is that it's generic, uh, so that is that you, you don't need an example instantiation. For example, um, if we are modeling a railway interlocking system, um, we could prove all the principles of railway interlocking are safe for all tra track layouts, irrespective of track layouts. Uh, and then, but then, if the automatic provers don't succeed, um, we we use a model checker to search for possible sequences of events to find a counterexample. Um, and then the counterexample will help us understand the problem in the model. Uh, but of course, for model checking, we do need an example instantiation. So, so if in our railway interlocking system, we would need to. Um, uh, instantiate the model with a particular track layout for, <coughs> for a station, for example. So I'm going to take you through a very simple example of modeling uh, using UMLB uh, to give you a feel for the approach. Uh, the example is a very simple access control system in which only certain permitted users are allowed in into some room, room which is called the the enclave. Uh, so I've modeled the most abstract level um, as a class representing the set of all users. 
uh, with a boolean attribute to say whether the user is permitted in the enclave or not. And then another class uh, represents the users, uh, it's a sub subset of the users uh, that are currently in the enclave. Uh, and then two methods of this class, um, enter enclave and leave enclave, um, the, the constructor and destructor for the class. So the set of instances represented by the uh, class can vary. And then um, the property at the bottom of the class is the security invariant, which says that all instances of the class must be permitted in the enclave. Uh, and then in order to preserve this invariant, uh, we need to, to put a guard on the constructor enter enclave um, so that it can only fire if the user entering is permitted in the enclave. But in the real world, how would we how how could the enclave know which users are permitted? The model's a specification of what we would like, but in its current form it's difficult to see how we, we could implement it. So this is a um, refined class diagram. The white classes are refined classes, and the yellow one is a new class that we've added in this refinement level. And we've in this refinement we've added um, the notion of identity cards. So a card identifies a unique user, and if a user holds such a card, then they are permitted in the enclave. So note that we allow cards to get stolen by other users. You can see the uh, steal card method in the user class. This is because we need to be careful to not to um, uh, accidentally exclude real world behavior uh, as that might hide a, a security problem. But now we can change the guard of the enter enclave method so that it uses the new identity cards so it can check that the user holds a card that identifies themselves. Um, but at first, uh, at this stage, the prover cannot prove that this is equivalent to the abstract guard about permission. You can see there's a, a brown uh, and a proof obligation means that it's not been proved. <coughs> so we need to add a, a new inver invariant uh, that gives extra information to the provers um, that it really is the basis of the design, it's the design assumption. And that's that um, if the card has been issued, i.e. a user holds it, then the user it identifies is permitted in the enclave. And this is sufficient, this invariant is sufficient uh, for the prover to, to deduce that the new guard implies the abstract one and prove discharge the, the proof obligation. Of course, then there's more proof obligations generated to ensure that the new invariant is true, but these are all discharged automatically by the provers. So in, in this um, next refinement, I've used a state machine to model a card entry access door. So initially it's closed and locked, and then when a user holds a card that identifies themselves, the card check OK transition is fired and the door unlocks. Then it can be opened and then a user can enter the enclave and the door automatically closes and locks uh, as they do so. Uh, so the guard on enter enclave is now simply that the door is open and the identity checking guard has moved to the ch card check OK transition. However, again, the proof obligation for guard equivalence cannot be proved, and in fact, uh, <coughs> in this case, the, the model is not strong enough. So after adding um, some example instantiation of users and cards, we can use Pro-B to model check the, the uh, model. And when we do that, Pro-B finds an event error 
because enter enclave is enabled in the refinement but not in the abstraction. So there's a problem with the model. Um, Probe B shows us a trace leading uh, to the error uh, that's in the history view in the uh, top right. Uh, and it shows us that after initialization, um, a card was issued to Dana. And then Dana presented the card, so card check OK fired. But then Colin opened the door. So the problem is that the model um, uh, doesn't prevent another user coming along and uh, opening the door and entering um, after a, a permitted user has unlocked it. <coughs> so this reflects a real world uh, security problem of tailgating. And we could come up with a, um, some kind of solution. Perhaps we could um, uh, add something to ensure that there are no no other users in the vicinity of the door. Or, or we could just make an assumption that permitted users prevent the tailgating. But I'm going to leave the model here as I want to go on to talk about uh, scenarios and behavior validation. So, so far we've been talking about verification and we have, we've done that in a particularly rigorous way using invariance, refinement and proof. But it's no use having a beautifully consistent model if it doesn't behave in a useful way. So we also need to be able to test the behaviour of the model. To do this, we've borrowed ideas from the world of behaviour driven development, BDD, which uses scenarios to illustrate the requirements and drive the development of the system. So we've adapted BDD for formal modelling of requirements, hence behaviour driven formal modelling. The difference is that we need uh, scenarios at different levels of abstraction uh, to match the refinements in our models. Once we've chosen an initial abstraction, we, we invent correspondingly abstract scenarios that describe its behaviour. Then for each refinement, we can add the appropriate details into the abstract scenarios to obtain scenarios suitable for the, the new level of refinement. In some cases, we might be given detailed scenarios as part of the specification that we're trying to model. If that's the case, then we need to go in the other direction and abstract away details to get abstract scenarios. Whichever way the scenarios are abstracted or refined, we found it's useful to do this before starting the modeling so that the behavior drives the formal modeling. To make the scenarios precise, we invent a suitable domain-specific language, which is based on the Cucumber language used in BDD. To support the approach, we've developed a scenario checker tool for recording and replaying scenarios. Internal events, such as the control system's response, are fired automatically, so that they don't need to be mentioned in the scenario. And private variables of the controller can be hidden so that they're not checked during the scenario. We can, al we can also use other animation visualization tools alongside the scenario checker to help visualize the state. <coughs> so here's an example of an abstract scenario and its refined version for the access control system written in one of our DSLs. At the abstract level, the scenario simply focuses on whether or not a user is allowed access. But in the refined scenario, this is replaced with the behavior based on checking ID cards. So note that we don't need to check, recheck the abstract state in the refined scenario, because this is guaranteed by refinement. So for example, the refined scenario checks the user holds a valid card, but it doesn't check whether the user actually made it into the enclave, because that has been proved by the theorem provers. Our DSLs are based on the Gherkin language, which is part of the Cucumber framework for BDD. So in this screenshot, um, we show the model being validated using the scenario checker to replay a previously recorded scenario. And the upper windows show a visualization of the state of the system using Bmotion Studio on the left and the UMLB state machine animator on the right. 
The lower left window is the scenario checker control, which has buttons to control the scenario. In record mode, the external vents can be selected and fired from here, but in playback, they're now greyed out as the next event is controlled by the recording. <coughs> the centre view is the state checker, which highlights any differences in the variables from when the scenario was recorded. And to the right, there is a console view showing scenario checker actions to help the user keep track of progress. The scenario checker allows you to manually step through the animation of a scenario, displaying important state variables at each step and automatically executing any internal events that represent the execution of a controller response. So in this example, I've made the door open automatically <coughs> after it's unlocked. So if you look at the, the top uh, event in the um, console, after the external event check card check OK fired, the open door fires, internal event open door fires as part of that big step. <coughs> so at any point during the playback, the scenario checker can be changed to record mode in order to create a different scenario from that point onwards. So, so far I've been um, using a rather simple example. <clears throat> so I wanted to show you a real cyber physical system that we've worked on. Uh, and this is the European Rail Traffic Management System Hybrid Level 3 specification. It's a system that allows both old and new trains to be run together on the same track. So the old trains use the existing train track detection blocks. That's the lower green and yellow blocks in the visualization. <coughs> and the new trains detect their position using GPS and communicate it via radio to the control system. This means that they can be controlled to a finer granularity using virtual sections. <coughs> That's the upper green, orange and red blocks in the visualization. So, and this train is a new train uh, which is currently in mission, which means it's communicating with the control system. The colour coding comes from the ERTMS specification, so green means the controller knows the block is free, yellow means the controller knows it's occupied, orange means it is occupied but <coughs> by at least one train, but maybe more, and red means the controller doesn't know whether it's occupied or not. The red bar above the train means it has a movement authority as far as the bar goes. So you can see from the scenario checker control panel on the left that there are quite a lot of um, external events in this system and from the console panel on the right that when one is fired there is um, it's followed by a number of internal events representing the processing to work out the new states of the VSSs. So we modelled this specification and we tried to prove it was safe but we had difficulties doing that there were some problems with the specification which we fed back and they did change the specification as a result of that. So in, the, in this specification it contained a number of provided scenarios uh, to, to illustrate the intended behaviour so we were able to run through those to check that our model was an accurate representation of the specification. To invent a, a DSL for um, the hybrid level 3, we first list the nouns involved in the system in a structured way like this. So trains are just named but with a label. Um, sections and subsections have a numbering scheme uh, using the prefixes TTD and VSS. And then for movement authority, we needed to split into two cases, abstract and concrete. This is because our DSL has to count for our abstract models, but also for the refinements. And in the abstract levels, we only talk about MA, whereas in refinements, we talk about two different kinds of MA, the FSMA and OSMA. <coughs> Once we've got the nouns, then we can add the adjectives that we need to in order to link nouns to describe state. So for example, a train is stood at a subsection and then verbs that we need in order to describe 
um, the, the control events. So a train enters a subsection. And this, this is um, an example scenario from the hybrid level three specification. Uh, and on the left is the natural language version from the specification. And on the right is the equivalent scenario in our DSL. Uh, so you can see that there's a, a fairly um, uh, easy correspondence between the natural language and the DSL one at this concrete level. Uh, the DSL one's a bit more c concise and clear, but in some cases we have to split phrases such as all VSS in TDD into several clauses. So in the um, scenario checker, we're using the DSL scenarios uh, to manually fire events and check the state. <clears throat> so we actually have a, a human uh, who's interpreting the scenario in terms of our uh, the events in our model. Uh, but since we've gone to the trouble of putting the scenario into the nice precise Gherkin language, it's a natural step to use the Cucumber framework to run the scenarios in a more automated way. For example, um, so that we could do some kind of regression test after we've changed the model. Uh, to do this, we have to write um, a cucumber step definitions. So for example, um, the top line here is the Gherkin command in our DSL. And at the bottom is the event B, event that we should fire um, for this command. And in the middle is the cucumber step that links them together. So um, the, the when leaves here is pattern matched on the Gherkin command. And as a result, the script fire runs this uh, piece of script here, where fire event is, a, is something we've written in Cucumber to, to find the correct event B event. And it finds this, this is the name of the event to fire. <coughs> and these are the parameters to pass to the event. So in this way, it links up the Gherkin command to the event B. <coughs> so in case you're um, interested in um, finding out a bit more about um, what we've done with the hybrid level three um, specification, I've added some links into the uh, slides. So the first one um, at the top is the, is the actual um, ERTMS hybrid level three specifications. Um, and then the, the second one is a paper that we've written about doing the modeling and the, the proving and model checking of the hybrid level three. And then the, the last one is um, another paper which is about using scenarios for formal modeling where you have to do the abstraction and refinement of scenarios. <clears throat> and that uses the hybrid level three as an example. So the next section describes our current work where we're developing methods for security analysis and threat identification to meet the needs of avionics standards such as ED202 and ED203. So we're using STPA systems theoretic process analysis which was developed by Nancy Leveson to provide a framework for conducting safety and hazard analysis. It focuses on the potential effects that could result if the system doesn't behave as it should. So SDPA SEC adapts SDPA for security threat analysis. And we've developed a formal modeling process to use SDP SEC in conjunction with UMLB and Event B. So firstly, we describe the main purpose of the system. In the, this case, it's to allow only author authorized users to access into the enclave. <coughs> This helps us to identify potential security losses. And then for each system action, the SDPA table identifies potential threats that could arise if the action is carried out or is not carried out or is carried out at the wrong time or in the wrong order. So for example, um, for the user enter enclave action, it would be a problem if it doesn't occur for an authorized user, but also a problem if it does occur for an unauthorized user. And in parallel with this, we develop a, an event B model as a formalization of the system. 
the event B provides more rigor to the STPA by checking that the analysis is, is accurate. And we found that there's a, a kind of bi-directional synergy, so the STPA guides the formal modeling, but also the formal modeling informs and verifies the STPA. And in some cases we found that the formal models reveal misunderstandings in the STPA analysis. Then we have to revise our approach to the system, rework the analysis and modify the models. In order to address the identified threats from this stage, we then make design decisions that introduce components that take responsibility for addressing the threats. In this case, we introduce a secure door component that only opens for authorised unit users. To model the introduction of new components, we make a refinement of our event B model. And then we can repeat the STPA process focusing on the requirements of a particular subcomponent at a time. So this analysis process flows down requirements to components at the same time providing an explanation and evidence suitable for certification. Note that systems often involve human users, so our analysis and models may need to incorporate assumptions about user behaviours. For example, the tailgating we discovered in the access control example. There are several important traceability issues going on here. So, uh, firstly, the requirements are being developed and handed down as derived responsibilities to components. Secondly, STPA provides an important justification for design decisions. And then thirdly, the formal models provide evidence that the threats identified by the STPA are addressed. So we're looking at improving tool support in the RODAM framework to provide traceability. So to summarise, um, abstract modelling gives clarity to critical properties while refinements ensure they are maintained as we move towards system design. Verification using theorem provers backed up by model checking is a powerful way to gain a deeper understanding of the system. Validation is equally important and tools to record and replace scenarios at different levels of abstraction ensure we develop the right system. Hazard and security analysis methods such as STPA and STPA-SEC work in hand in hand with formal models to provide evidence that we are developing a safe and secure system. I just wanted to mention our current project, a high class project, which is funded by the Aerospace Technology Institute in the UK. <coughs> it aims to improve model driven development methods for high integrity avionics systems, and it's very much an in industry led project, including 13 industrial partners, as well as three universities, including us. And then with, within high class, we're carrying on developing the scenario checker further developing the STPA-based security analysis uh, with security certification in mind, but also to support modelling towards component designs and generating models in semi-formal modelling tools that are suited for the design stages. So if you think any of this is interesting for you, please visit our new website at umlb.org. Here you'll find pages describing our current research directions and collaborations with different industrial partners. And there's also a guide to downloading and installing the tools. So the tools are all open source and freely available. And there's an email contact address. Um, so we're always pleased to provide support in using the tools. Okay, thank you for your attention.